my vampire masquerade. I'm Geek. With me as well. This is Ricky. Always. What's up? It's pretty early. Party on, guy. <laughs> Noticeably proud of his words of wisdom, he tries to top him off with one last swig. Single drop falls between his crooked teeth. He looks at the empty flask with the utmost contempt. Well, ain't that fucking poignant? <laughs> well, ain't that fucking poignant? Murmuring a curse under his breath, he makes a valiant effort to get up off the bench. As he staggers, struggling to remain upright, you offer your shoulder to lean on. He shoots you a smile that's a crooked as it is affectionate. Hey, kid. Sorry. You meet his gaze, trying to look friendly rather than condescending. You're all right. And with that heartfelt moment, you bid adieu to the sprawling vista and make your way towards the bridge. Next stop, Manhattan. Entering the park from midtown Manhattan, you promptly take a spot by one of the alleys not very deep into the park. Minutes pass, 5, 10, 15. You start to wonder if she's even going to show up. Suddenly you hear a familiar voice, but with an unfamiliar tone. She sounds almost nice. I don't remember who was her. You, you were definitely her. I don't remember how I voiced her. Uh, hello, Jenny. There she is, walking along the side of the fountain. She looks less out of place here than back at the junkie-infested hovel, but only by a slight margin. Something tells you... There are only so many places she would feel at home and probably not ones you would want to find yourself in. Bah. She glances over at you, barely, barely noticing your presence. Sorry about last time. Nothing personal, you understand? When I got caught up in the moment, I can get a bit intense. Now she's southern for no reason. Yeah, it's whatever. I don't think we have a southern girl yet. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> You're late. Sorry, honey. I got I had to attend an unscheduled meeting. This one. Using her pinky, she wipes a tiny spot of blood from the corner of her lips. A gentleman caller figured he could have his way with a girl sitting alone in a park at night. And so I took him aside and taught him some manners. One could say he was asking for it. But anyway, I was under the impression you had something to tell me. Why do I have to answer this? All right. We have a mutually beneficial proposition. Does that pup speak for you, Git? <laughs> okay. Because I'm getting a weird Sorcerer's Apprentice vibe right now. Man, if only I'd seen that film. <laughs> Give the kid a break, Val. We're here about Sana, the thin blood hereafter. The girl's a threat, and we need to find her. Figured we could do it faster if we worked together. Uh huh, keep going, honey, because I have a feeling there's a catch coming. The catch is. Awkward silence. It's not often you see him at a loss for words. Seeing him struggle, you decide to jump in. Yeah, <laughs> I know what I want to say, but I know how that's going to react, too, so. We want the girl to stay alive. See, now that's a deal breaker right there, sugar. She has She is words. Southern, okay. If you want me to ever consider it, you'll have to sweeten the pot. Once again, she turns to D'Angelo. And I bet tall, dark, and handsome over here might find, have some ideas. <laughs> you want a good year. Just tell us That's tempting, want. yeah. Just tell us what you want. Oh, you're no fun anymore. Was Buddy that... Python! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a running gag in at least one of their episodes. I haven't seen that show in a long time. <laughs> she wants a higher profit target to show off to the prince what a good little scourge she is. Higher profile. Uh, that all you care about nowadays, huh? Playing the game, climbing the ranks. Smile creeps onto her lips. You can tell it's forced. D'Angelo definitely knows how to get under her skin. Ooh. That's my Jenny. 
big old brain and a heart to match. Once again, she turns to you. I knew right away he'd try to help this girl. He does love him, a damsel in distress. But you, I'm still not sure what your angle is. These are all good. Yeah. Well, I don't like the middle one, I'll be honest. I Okay, I'm going to go rare and not worry about the consequences and just say what I would say. I don't have an angle. It just seems like the right thing to do. Oh, wow. Seriously? Jenny, you got yourself a live one. Good for you. So there. You know my terms. Contact me when you've made up your mind. Don't take too long, though. I'm a lucky girl. I might just find your little thin blood on my own. Still, I hope we can work together. We did make a good team back in the day, didn't we? Slowly, seductively, she puts her arm around his shoulder. She glances over to you, clearly enjoying how awkward it makes you feel. <laughs> I don't want to say anything. I just want to stand there and like deal with it. I'm just like, you guys have fun. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> D, once this meeting is over, you'll have some explaining to do. You hear that, Jimmy? You're in some hot water now. <laughs> anyway. Withdrawing from the strange half-embrace, she flicks D'Angelo's nose gently with her index finger. Almost instantly, she turns flirtatious from, ter flirta from flirtatious to dispassionate. However this plays out, I have a feeling we'll meet again sooner than later. Until then... You look over to D'Angelo, and his nose is missing from where she flicked it. <laughs> Without sparing you another glance, she disappears down an unlit park alley. D'Angelo watches her go. The look on his face, a mixture of longing and guilt, is borderline comical. Finally, he turns back towards you, as if breaking some spell he was under. Well, that could have gotten a lot worse. I'm just glad I'm not the only could've one screwing up the lines now. Worse. Yeah. <laughs> What do you mean by a higher profile target? That's not what, it's whom. She wants me to give her Larson. Larson? Why would she want him? Or her? Wait, who's Lar Larson's? The guy in charge of the Thin Blood group. Oh, okay, okay. For some reason I was thinking that was my I boss. Think. Oh, no, that's um, Langley. Oh, okay. Langley, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a premogen, right? A weak one, but still. For Scourge, he's a much more valuable target than some no-name Dustbone. It just so happens that a certain someone might have some dirt on him. He squints, rubbing the bridge of his nose. Fuck it, I'm heading back to the office. Need to put my feet up, get some blood flowing to the old noggin. You coming? You nod. Why the hell not? And so, you make your way towards 5th Avenue, you've got a long way ahead of you, and a lot of stuff to figure out. I feel like your character is just so, like... Basic? Uh, no. Oh, what's, I had the word, and then I lost it. Boring? <laughs> like, like, giving up. <laughs> like, ah, uh, I guess this is what we're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like, what else is he supposed to do, you know? He's like, fuck you, woman! Like, no, what? <laughs> Although it's not your first visit, you still find it hard to navigate the dark, rust-ridden corners of the grain terminal. Luckily, this time, you're with someone who could probably do this blindfolded, so you just follow his lead. As you're both climbing the rickety stairs leading to the mezzanine, you suddenly notice light coming from D'Angelo's office. A quick look assures you that, no, he did not, in fact, leave it on. You bust through the door like an undead tango and hooch. Yeah. Or was that Turner and Cash? <laughs> Wow, two movie references. I can't believe are in this. <laughs> Tyrion and Hooch, Tango, Ca oh, and one of the four is a dog. <laughs> wow. Ready to, <laughs> ready to unleash the holy fury on the intruders. You half expect an arch death squad or an SI hunting party. Instead, you get Larson, who nearly falls out of the chair when you two bust in. <laughs> I'm missing you already. 
<laughs> well, look who it is. Missed us already. Hardly. No, I think I was him. Uh, I think you're him. Hardly. There you go. He just always looks like there's a stick up his butt. Because there is. Yeah. <laughs> Seemingly both intrigued and irritated by the surprise visit, D'Angelo walks over to a cabinet and pulls out a first cigar. Then may I ask what brings you, O oh, venerable primogen, to our humble abode? Her. He points at a tiny shadow, covering, cowering in the corner of the room. To your astonishment, it turns out to be a very familiar face. I don't know. I, I think I was her. The, the blood. No, not again. Please. Where the hell did you find her? Outside my front door. She must have heard of me. Found out where I lived. It's not uncommon knowledge among the dustborn. She probably figured... I could help, but honestly, I have no idea what to do with her. I mean, I should turn her into the prince, but it's just another strike against my people. Then again, I can't just set her loose, not after what she did. Fuck D'Angelo! You can tell I'm that desperate if my first instinct was to come to you. No, Larson, I would attribute that decision to what's left of your common sense. He leans over to you. Hey, kid, I think we should call it a night. Just give me some time to talk to the girl. Maybe I'll get through her, to her somehow. The sign. The sign is always there. Though I ain't holding my breath. Honestly, you're glad to leave him to it. Spending the night in a small room with a tiny serial killer somehow doesn't seem too appealing. Still, you're hoping Angelo will be all right. He's got some tough choices ahead of him. I, I didn't want to go to bed. I want to stick with it. <laughs> We're not done. Damn it. Now what you want to do is... So that's, um... Again, Tamika. Bro. Yep. Well, there's a reporter. There's a faith people. Let's deal with this reporter. <gasps> Ugh. The street lights flicker into the apartment in the stark white glow as if someone were shooting a movie outside. That's Langan's apartment, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. The art pieces display a tasteful, expensive, in tasteful expense entirely fitting the image you have of Sophie. It feels as if a thousand sins have been committed on these premises, most of them under her benevolent hospitality. Sophie comes to greet you as you enter the living room, shaking her head. You understand that people judge me based on how you dress, don't you? Sophie looks at your clothes as if resigned to your sitar... Sartorial in limitations. If I had other things to worry about than shopping for clothes. Sophie walks to the window and looks out. Streetlights playing on her features. She reminds you of a queen contemplating the unfortunate limitations of her subjects. You'd think that as a vampire, at least we wouldn't have to worry about the virtues of the press. Vultures vultures of the press. Unfortunately, when you have power and ability, there is always parasites trying to feed on you. Is there a reporter after you? Yes, a terribly persistent creature. Sophie steps away from the window and settles down on the sofa, a, on the sofa, a wine glass with red liquid in it, blood treated as not to spoil. You've become good at noticing the scent, even from a distance. She doesn't offer you any, as you cautiously sit down across from her. This awful man has been stalking my apartment with a camera. He's gone through my trash, talked to the neighbors. Please be a dear and explain to him that there's nothing for him here. Now I'm mixing my two females. It's... I don't <laughs> think people care that much. More British. Yeah. Got it. Is this about the masquerade? That's a big deal for us, right? Indeed. You're learning. That's the dumbest thing this character has had to say, I think. <laughs> what was my other option? It won't tell me. It won't tell yeah, me. Damn it. All right. Probably both those. This must happen often. How do you usually deal with it? Everyone has their way. Sometimes a problem goes away with a bit of money or sharp words. Other times... He needs something more. Am I into that? I'm scared. Be scared. 
You know anything about this reporter? Man, woman, young, old, anything like that? All gossip reporters look the same to me. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dark Souls! Does that, that one get recorded. Yeah, so. well, Big Mac Domingo, nobody knows who that is, and I don't care either. Go ahead. You know who it is. I know, I know, but like, <laughs> these people might not, and right. I don't want to... I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... It's our ginger friend. Time for you to go. I have business to attend to. You leave the apartment as Sophie disappears into another room. You don't have a clear idea of the game she plays with the city's mortal and immortal power structures. But she always seems to be making a move. Outside on the street, there's a slight warm drizzle. The kind that gets under your clothes and makes you want to take a shower when you get back to your own haven. No reporters immediately jump out to you. For a while, it feels like nothing is happening in the New York night. People are walking past you on either way to whatever nightlife diversions help them forget their sordid lives. As you contemplate going back inside and telling Sophie you're not looking for a new career as a lookout, you suddenly notice the lens of a camera pointed at you across the street. Hey! You yell and run across the street. It's a man you're sure you've seen somewhere before. Rotund, pasty, someone who's spent too much time in badly ventilated rooms, stained with cigarette smoke. You enter an alley, a dark, dingy space between two tall, tall buildings, once upon a time, a place like this might have worried you. Make you think of muggings or violence. Now it's clear that the most dangerous thing here is you. The man you are following seems to realize this, too. He holds his camera in front of him like a shield. Its heavy objective, rest, it's heavy objective resting on his paunch. With a start, you recognize him. You remember the face, the shade of sunglasses from a picture next to a byline in some trashy paper you were reading to kill time. Something about celebrity scandal sex. His name is Frank Doherty. Of course it is. You saw him on the street one time with a camera outside the nightclub. Probably waiting for someone important to come out so he could take their picture. Hey, don't go around scaring people like that. Oh. I'm... <laughs> Welcome to Knuckle Town. Did Frank Dory, I recognize you from that thing. That thing. <laughs> Do you hear that thing I said to you? <laughs> You're a fake reporter, right? I'm a real reporter, damn it. <laughs> a lot of scoops here in this dirty alley. You can't be a journalist if you're not willing to get your hands dirty. He I looks sound, like a scumbag. I'm trying to sound fatter. I know. Harder. <laughs> <laughs> Do you live here? I'm working on a story about a local resident. Her name is Sophie Langley. Everyone knows her in high society circles. She's a redhead, pretty as a picture, and there were a lot of pictures of her through the years. That's the thing, in fact. Look at this. Frank pulls out his phone and starts showing you pictures. Some have been downloaded from news sites while others are photos from society pages of newspapers from past decades. All show Sophie. She has different clothes, hairstyles, makeup names, but the face remains the same. See, I know what he's implying. This is the Doctor Who syndrome. I think so. I'm not 100%. <sighs> but I think that's where he's going to end up going. Yeah, but like none of these questions help me disprove that. Or statements. They're all hot. Other than that, I'm not sure. Come on, look at the face. It's always the same. Now he's got... <laughs> now, I, now I am stuck to not being able to reply to this. You must have a theory about what's happening. I have a theory or two, but before I print my theory, I need facts to back it up. <laughs> facts! <laughs> Three words, extreme plastic surgery. All the celebrities do it, only her doctor is better than the rest. You look critically at the photos on Frank's phone. <laughs> You're thinking the world's best plastic surgeon is working out of this alley? 
Okay, fine. I don't know what this is about. So how would you explain it? Have you considered the possibility that those pictures are a hoax? Sure, anything can be a hoax. But I dug up those papers from the archives myself. I got to have something usable. Legal action or violence? Which would you prefer? <laughs> See, both of these could bite me in the ass. You're so worried. If, well, if I use legal action, I have no, nothing to back it up with. And I'm sure he's dealt with that shit before. Okay, I'm, I'm going off book here. The powers of blood make... Powers of the blood make kindred fearsome killers. Looking at Frank, you decide that you can administer this beatdown without help from your undead amp nature. What? Oh. This was the wrong moment to develop professional pride. You punch Frank in the mouth, perhaps the most important thing about your new vampiric existence is getting used to violence. You have to hunt, defend yourself. Frank falls down to one knee. This is not defending yourself. Please don't! You smack Frank across the face. You feel his pers perspiration sticking to your skin. Blood wells from his mouth. You have a sudden urge to bite down and drink. So if you probably wouldn't appreciate a corpse in the alley next to her home, so you restrain yourself. Frank is on all fours on the wet ground. You pick up his camera and casually fling it into the wall. The telephoto lens breaks off. Oh my god, please don't! <sighs> this is not going to end well. I... I don't think it would have, no matter what I picked, because it's part one. I, <laughs> I, I liked that moment in Deadpool, where they're like, you're still alive, only on the outside. This is not going to end well for me, as I don't say bad. He's like, it's not going to end well for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I probably should... I, I feel like killing him is the best way to get rid of him. But first I would want to like find all his evidence and destroy that, but alright. Run your mouth and I'll break the rest of your teeth. Frank staggers upright, runs out of the alley as best he's able, leaving his ruined camera behind. He looked after his receding figure, wondering if he'll have the courage to return. See the thing is, now I've told him he has something here. Possibly. He might be more afraid, though. Who knows? <clears throat> well, it's part one, so he won't be. He's just immortal. You got this. <sighs> yeah. The sheriff of New York... Oh, Quadrille. <laughs> Sheriff of New York is knocking at the door to your haven. Oh, I'm already regretting it. The sight comes as more than a little shocking. If he had business with you, you'd either... Expect to see him already inside, or the nerve to see him coming at all. Yet there he is, on the other side of the people, patiently and politely waiting for you to let him in. Carefully unlock the door and face him in silence. Evening. May I come in? You simply stare at him. Your lack of an answer doesn't faze him. And you lack the resist... And your lack of resistance as he starts walking inside has obviously been interpreted as permission. Once he's... Fuck. <laughs> Once inside, he starts looking around as you casually stand by the door. Cautiously stand by the door. Haven't really had time to make the place your own yet, have you? It feels like Langley's apartment through and through. A secluded study where nobody studies anything. Yep, he's talking. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the books on this shelf, obviously meant to impress guests, not to be read. They reveal nothing about their owner, aside from the aching desire to be taken seriously as an intellectual. 
He picks one of them up and smirks before putting it away. <sighs> the phenomology of the spirit. Next to all of this garbage poetry, we can make a bet. If she reads more than 20 pages, I owe you $50 and a gallon of bourbon. Again, can't wait to <laughs> cut this. Yeah, he talks a lot. Yeah. The kind of place that self-professed hermits entomb themselves in to suffer. Considering how much you have to run around these nights, you probably only use it to shelter from the sun and rest. Right? Even though he's obviously making an effort to come off as non-threatening, it's impossible to forget the first impression he made. You still see him as a fierce predator, Trying hard not to expose his true colors, you sense a familiar fight-or-flight response as you struggle to find a diplomatic answer to his last question. If Quadril is bothered by your silence, he doesn't let it show. He keeps walking around, toying with whatever catches his eye. Eventually, he speaks up again. Shit-talking your boss over and over. What should he baseball lately? If I had to guess, you strike me as a Red Sox fan. Now he's inviting you to talk in a more direct manner. You attempt to overcome your physical reaction to him and reply as casually as you can. <laughs> Wait, are you sure you want to value? I know, I don't know. Yeah, uh, horrible choices. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, Would that suck if they made it actually matter? <laughs> that would kind of be awesome. Like there's a hidden tree. <laughs> Your mind keeps going back to that night when everything was changed forever. The darkness. Yes. Locking up in hell. God damn it. Bacon. I know. I didn't get that far. <laughs> Waking up in hell with a body next to you. Spending a night in that underground sweatbox. Unsure of what will happen next. The endless car ride. Three strikes. A bloodthirsty crowd. That blade. A rebirth. A baptism by fire. A frightening executioner who made sure the flames scarred your spirit. As you look into his face, you realize he read the emotions from yours. Not in the mood to exchange pleasantries, hmm? There's no animosity in his voice, he is just stating a fact. Let me get straight to the point of that. He momentarily stops caring about his surroundings, turning all of his attention to you and demanding the entirety of your attention in return. Yeah. <laughs> God, Dude, shut he was, up. No, he's great. <laughs> you see, there's something I've realized over the years. In large part, I may have been hired just to look menacing with a sword. But my job is all about seeing through bonds and relationships. The Camarilla would be safe as long as its members adhered to a certain social contracts. Making their... Dealings with the ephemetry is plain for everyone to see, but that obviously remains a pipe dream. <sighs> this is a community born of conspirators, overly ambitious gangsters and politicians, monsters in denial, all sorts of tragically broken individuals. <laughs> they are usually driven oh they are driven by desires that make them incompatible with the masquerade incompatible with the prolonged survival of the Camarilla incompatible with the methods I use to operate woe is me blah 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 and so I am doomed to be like a cop, constantly insulted behind my back, maybe for a good reason, but immediately called for help whenever someone loses their tableware. <sighs> or like an Anthony Agatha Christie novelist. Protagonist. God damn it! <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm... It's not you, it's not you, I'm just so sick of fucking up. <sighs> Or like an Agatha Christie protagonist, outwardly assigned, assisted by everyone, but constantly lied to about everyone's past mo and motivations. 
Even if my failure to solve the mystery might be the end of us all. Get to the point! <laughs> he tries to sound like he's peacefully resigned to his fate, but it's easy to detect a tinge of regret in his voice, a voice belonging to someone who once had bigger ambitions than this. <laughs> Before he took an arrow to the knee. What broke him? Blah, 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 blah. Oh my god! Going Don't make it feel like I'm reading an Agatha Christie novel. <laughs> Those are good though. I, I should read one. As you see for this detective, the why done it is far more important than the who done it or how done it. When you understand all the players and their mutual obligations, you easily understand every crime. <sighs> I learned my lesson. <laughs> but of course the kindred know it, so they devise ways to make my job harder. Just by, just like conspiracies between two unrelated actors that depend on scratching each other's backs for mutual security. Dictionary update! Yay! Uh, for a second I thought it was done in one thing. Well, they enforce a blood bond to make someone unexpected their thrall. A boss serving their employee, a rebel serving a tyrant, just because one is regularly being forced to drink another's blood. What has Sophie seen in you? Why does the prince keep asking me about your actions? How come you're being pushed to build your own courtes so fast? I'd like that information too! <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe I'm the video game protagonist. What? <laughs> yeah, right? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you are surrounded by unclear motivations which you yourself don't understand. That unnerves me, and it should unnerve you as well. Well, tell me. No. <laughs> Get to the point! Where's that option? <laughs> you unnerve me. What do you want to you? you unnerve me. <laughs> His monologue has gone on for far enough. <laughs> Why are you here? What is this about? Finally, you managed to raise your voice. Quadril notices the effort and smiles softly. And blah, blah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so you haven't gone mute since the last time I saw you. Good. Oh, that was short enough just to piss me off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when they're more concise, it's more yeah, of a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more of a, you're an asshole. <laughs> Now I will continue to dialogue. Well, I'm here for a selfish reason. I need to develop a rapport with you to better fulfill my obligations. We get to be friends with the Executioner! Yay! I always wanted to be friends with my Executioner. Jesus Christ. <laughs> the last time we met, I couldn't see you as my equal. Now that you've been accepted into the Camarilla, what choice do I have? I do not see us as equals. You will kick the shit out of me. <laughs> I understand if you didn't want to see my face again. But I am one of the faces of the New York City community. And as long as you're part of it, I'm going to be impossible to avoid. <sighs> <laughs> Which is more infuriating. <laughs> I wanted to be friends. Why can't you just say that? <laughs> Especially when I have business with you. And I do. As you might have guessed by now, one of my tasks is uncovering and understanding your bonds. And one of them might endanger our community. I bet he's not going to tell me which one. That's not menacing at all. Well, that's not, yeah. <laughs> well, that's not menacing at all. Who is he talking about? I don't know who he's talking about. It's not one of these options. I bet you it's Jessica. Jessica. Oh, wait. I, I haven't talked to her since I got changed, though. I know. <laughs> Someone from my car... Well, I don't know what this one is. Uh, Coterie would be the people you're talking to, like... Um, oh, the oh, list of people on the yeah. map? Okay. You mean someone I'm trying to recruit into my courtier? Quadril shakes his head. It, it, could, it could have easily been Hope, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the cop, because we're, like, poking some bears with that. Yeah. Or even just beating up the reporter. I honestly thought that's where this was going. <laughs> Quadril shakes his head. I am monitoring them, and they know it. If they... If they're breaking the rules, they're doing it the right way. Meaning I haven't learned about it yet. Good job, them. Unless you might want to share something. 
A moment of awkward silence. Joking. Mostly. <laughs> I yeah. hear I hear Hope the socks. <laughs> I'm told they mostly come out at night. Mostly. mostly. <laughs> They mostly come at night. Mostly. There, we got the second part. Of the worst of it is, I'm quoting that more from South Park than the actual movie. Oh. I, I didn't see that episode. Oh, okay. There's a file from underneath his coat and it passes it to you. This is our troublemaker. You open the file and see some printed photos. You freeze up as you recognize the face and are overwhelmed by a flood of repressed memories. <laughs> Jessica. Jessica Lowell. Lowell. The woman who made the last few years of your life heaven and the last few weeks of living hell. Since she took pretty much everyone you knew with her after the split, you thought the transition to this life would be painless. No baggage at all. Have you thought wrong? You look up at Quadrille expecting answers. Alright, we're going to find out hopefully some of those answers next episode. We'll catch you guys later. See ya. Bye. Bye.